I love summer because I wanted to be every single one of those scenes. I wanted to be every single one of those people. And so I'm one of our first summer vacations as a married couple, Paul and I, is we went to Colorado. Colorado's been a love of ours since, since childhood for me, I think for him as well. And so we decided that, I mean, we'd probably be married maybe one or two years. We were going to go on, on this trip to Colorado. My mom and dad were going. My grandparents were going. And it's always great to camp with my grandparents because they have one of those huge fifth wheels. So like when the tent gets cold, you can go in there or grandma makes breakfast, right? So you don't have to, I mean, the campfire is just for fun. You know, it's not for food. Those, that's the way I like to camp. So um, anyway, so, but, but just to kind of let you know that I'm not, not truly a, a camper per se, because you know, it, it's still, it's early, early summer and it gets a little cold chilly in Colorado at night. And so we had a, a space heater in our tent and earlier in the week, I had set my pillow on fire from the space heater. So, I mean, you can kind of get the idea of what kind of campers we are. We, we, we were able to put, put, the, put it out. But, so we're, we're tenting. So we decide, Paul and I, you know, we're young, we're in shape, and we are going to go on a hike. Okay? So we, we, mom and dad are dropping us off, and it's, we decided to hike close to Estes Park, if you know Colorado at all. But uh, we were, our, our takeoff point was Bear Lake. And we were going to go, we're, it's going to be seven miles. Okay? So it's, you know, piece of cake seven miles. Okay, so we, uh, we're getting ready to take off, and mom and dad are like, all right, we're figuring it's probably going to take you, what, three, four hours. We'll meet you at the extraction point, which I don't even know where that was. But anyway, meet you there in about three or four hours. So lunch, we'll go out and have lunch together. It'll be fun, because we left really early in the morning. So we went there, we started our hike, and we get maybe a mile and a half, two miles in, and Paul said, I think the trail goes this way. And I said, I don't know. I, I think this might be the trail. And he goes, no, I'm pretty sure the trail goes this way. And this is before I knew he was horrible with directions, okay? So I'll just say that. So anyway, so we start going off on the trail. I'm like, well, all right. I mean, I'll just, that's fine. We'll just go this trail. And so we get, I'm like, this trail seems really narrow. Paul, I don't, I don't think this is the trail. I don't, I, I don't, Tammy, this is the trail. All right, all right, it's the trail. All right. So we're going on the trail a little further. And, and I'm like, I said it like four or five times. Paul, are, are you sure this is the trail? Maybe we should just t take this right on back and go back out. Nope, this is the trail. I'm sure of it. Okay, this was not the trail. Okay, I'm just telling you. I knew in my heart of hearts, this was not the trail. And so, but I'm like, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna follow him. I mean, we're, we're in this together, right? <laughs> so we get to the point where I, we are, it gets, the trail just kind of gets narrow and narrower. And then all of a sudden, we are on a cliff like this wide, shimmying on the cliff like this. I'm looking down, Paul, I know this isn't the trail. This is not the trail. And then, and then when, the, when the path shimmied completely into the side of the cliff, he was willing to admit this wasn't the trail. <laughs> so here we are shimmying back down. But I have to tell the view was incredible. I mean, we were, if, if you could just like not be freaked out and just kind of look, you know, I have never climbed a cliff. That's just not me. And so I was looking out, Long's Peak was right there, which is one of the biggest peaks in, in Rocky Mountain National Forest. And so there we are. So we, we come back down and then we, we finally get down to where there's like, you're not on a cliff. And I have no clue. We have no clue. We can't even find this little, little trail that we come up on. No idea where to go. And we'd been traveling this trail for a good little while. And so we were lost. And um, I'm going to go to my next section of the story, and I'm just like, you know, fast forward there. But I want you to know, just to preface my reactions, <laughs> we were lost probably five to six hours. Okay? So it wasn't just like, oh, 30 minutes, and then we found our way. We were climbing up mountains. I had an apple in my pocket that had turned to sauce, okay? Like climbing mountains, falling, sliding down. I mean, five to six hours trying to find our way. And it was at the point when I looked in and I, uh, we were exhausted. We could tell it was late afternoon. And I knew I did not want to spend the night. I mean, I knew how cold my tent got. And I was at a lot lower elevation. And I did not want to spend the night on the side of that mountain. And so, and then I looked up. And I said, Paul, don't move, don't move. There was an elk breathing down his neck, like huge. I didn't know those things were so huge. They're not that big on TV. So anyway, huge elk breathing down Paul's neck. And I said, just don't move. I think it's a mama. Let's just hope it doesn't have babies on the other side. You know, because, and I'm like, so we just stood really still. 
And as soon as that was gone, I lost it. Okay, um, I, uh, I share my emotions fairly freely. Anybody that knows me. And I'm like, what am I going to do? What if this happens? What if that happens? I don't know. And when I freak out and fear starts gripping a hold of me, my thoughts fly from one thing to another like my husband switches TV channels. Like, boop, 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 And I'm like, we're going to die. We're never going to get out of here. We're never going to find They're never going to find us. We don't even know where we are. We don't even know where to go to where we are. And it just, it just kept going on. My husband should have slapped me. He didn't. Love his heart. He didn't. But he should have. Because I flipped out. And he said, Paul, Timmy, 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 calm down, calm down, calm down. We need to pray about it. I'm like, oh, what's that going to do? We're stuck. It's going to draw us a map. <laughs> Tammy, let's just think. Now, we just, if we follow water, water will always lead us, lead us to civilization. Look, let's listen. There's got to be roads around here. Let's listen for a road. Okay, okay. So we did. We started following water. I figured it wasn't going to lead us anywhere. I just figured. And so, um, but it did. We walked for, for a good little while. And, uh, you know, I don't know why we weren't wearing watches. I have no idea, you know, before cell phones, but we didn't have watches either. And so we uh, were, were seasoned hikers. That's what we are. <laughs> and so we, uh, we came up into a clearing, and I saw, like, a glorious sight, like beams from heaven. There was a tent. <laughs> we have found people. And so I, in my calm, rational manner, run up to the tent. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you're here. We've been lost for like hours, hours. We've been lost for hours. And we just don't know what to, you know where the trail is. Where's the trail? Can you get us back to the trail? Oh my gosh, I'm so glad to see you. They didn't speak English. <laughs> I don't know how long she thought I was lost on that trail, but I bet it was longer than four or five hours. <laughs> And so, but we, they, they heard enough to know to kind of get us to the trail. We were able to communicate enough. We got on the trail. We still had five miles to go, but it was fine because I knew where I was going. Like the trail was clearly marked, Conrad, clearly, <laughs> but it didn't matter. And so this story, I, this story came to my mind last week when Chad was talking about anxiety and, and peace in the midst of anything. And I'm like, Chad wasn't with me on that mountain. He for sure would have slapped me. Because I was scared. I was really, really scared. And it was hard to be rational when you were really, really scared. And I, I'm not proud of my reactions. I'm not proud of my actions. But they were controlling me at that moment. And I thought, man, how do I find peace in this? How do I control my reactions? How do I control where my mind is going? in this situation, or when a driver cuts me off, or drives too slow in that fast lane. It's time to pass, people. We should all learn this. If nothing else, come away with nothing else today. We should all drive faster in the fast lane. <laughs> Sorry, I got all excited and ruined my mic. Okay, or, or what about when somebody says something that kind of hurts? They may not even know that, they, that it hurt you, and that's all you can hear all day in your head. And you, you can't get rid of it. Or, or what if I'm waiting on a test result that has me shaking in my shoes? Or I'm left with pieces of what was supposed to have lasted forever? Or I make a choice that leaves me broken? Or when life is just so unfair this should not have happened. I should not be in this position right now. I didn't do anything to deserve this. Or when I'm going through grief or a pain that cripples me, and sometimes I can't even think through it. Or sometimes one of the scariest points is when I think I'm perfectly fine because I've traded true peace for fake peace for just calmness, for routine, or becoming numb and quit caring. Because those can be really scary. At least I recognize anxiety when I'm bubbling up with it. But when I just live at the status quo, 
that can be a really scary place to be because I don't even allow God to be present enough in my life to know I need to change, to know the deep peace that he offers. And then I try to find my temporary fix because I do that. I'm trying to compensate for for these feelings, this anxiety, this stress, this numbness. Sometimes my temporary fix is I read a book. There's nothing wrong with reading a book, but sometimes I use it to escape the feelings and the thoughts that I have at the moment. I don't want to think about this. I don't want to deal with this. This is creating anxiety within me. I'm just going to go read a book. Or I eat, or I shop, or you fill in the blank. We all have them. You fill in the blank. Because we are trying to compensate for this emptiness, this stress, this thing that's causing anxiety. Um, Dr. Caroline Leaf is a cognitive neuroscientist. I I just really wanted to say that right. She studies the brain, okay? But did it make me sound smart that I remembered cognitive neuroscientist? Anyway, so anyway, Dr. Caroline Leaf has shown, she has done a lot of studies on the brain, and she has a picture of the brain as a toxic memory, and I think we have a picture of it. There it is. You see that empty spot right there? Every time we have a toxic memory, we've been hurt, we've been damaged, we have stress that we can't get over. We have um, all of that toxic toxicity within us. It's not just emotional. It actually leaves a space in our brain. Isn't that incredible? This is physiological. When we don't live in peace, when we are stressed out, when we have a memory that we can't get over, unforgiveness, bitterness, any of that stuff, it leaves a space in our brain because we just can't deal with it. And your brain's just like, well, I'm just going to bypass that. That was incredible to me that it was a physiological thing as well. So where's my peace then? If it's physiological, it's emotional, Where in the world can I find peace? Because last week, Chad talked about, in in Philippians 4, 7, and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And it will. And, And he does. Because when we ask for the peace of God, he will be there. But Paul doesn't stop there. Paul doesn't stop there with instructing us on how to find peace in our lives. He goes on to Philippians 4, 8, and 9, and here's what he says there. He says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, lovely, admirable, think about such things. Because here's what Paul knew. What we think about makes a difference. What we put into our mind, what we think about, what we spend time on, our influences, they make a difference to how we think, to how we process, and to how we live. And here's an example. Marketing, the marketing industry has figured this out a long time ago. And billions and billions of dollars are spent on teaching you to think differently. Like this ad right here. In the 80s, Nike came out with this ad, Just Do It. At that time, they were not the biggest sports company. Adidas was. Adidas sold more tennis shoes. But Nike said, hey, running, it's not just for marathon runners. It's for anybody. Anybody can do this. Everybody needs to get in shape. Everybody needs to uh, get the fitness craze. And all you need to is just do it. Just do it. It became a craze. And they are now the leading tennis shoe sales of pe- uh, people in the world because of this ad. They changed people's thinking to get up off the couch and just do it. And if that wasn't enough, then this company decided to say, let's personalize it. Let's not just say that you need a Coke. Let's put your name on it. Let's put your friend's name on it. Let's put your teammate's name on it. And then you need that because it's got my name on it. Oh, it's got Jennifer's name on it. Let's get her a Coke. And so they personalize it. They don't just make it a a just ad that we all need to do it. Jenny, you need a Coke. Oh, yes, I do. It says it right there. Or they show pictures like this. 
oh, look at that. It's like got the fizz on the top. It's making me thirsty right now. Because they know that they can influence you and that they can shape the way that you think. They can shape your desires to want what they are offering. And then your money is going to follow that and your devotion is going to follow that. So marketing has figured it out a long time ago. But scripture figured it out even before then. Because what we think about, what we spend our time on, what we allow into our brain affects us and it makes a difference. Paul is telling us that in this passage, that we need to focus on whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable, excellent, praiseworthy. And these are the things that we should think about because these are the things that can transform us. These are the things that can keep us into this peace that he was talking about earlier in the chapter. And he said, this is what's going to make a difference to you. Yeah, pray to me. Please pray to me. Cast your anxieties onto me. But you have to know who I am because here's the thing. The only thing that's admirable, right, true, lovely, praiseworthy, excellent, the only thing that I know of that are all of those things is God, is Jesus Christ. That's the only thing that fits all of those qualifications. And the only place that I know to find who the character of God is, is in scripture. Because this book, from cover to cover, tells the story of God's interaction with his people. It tells who God is at any given point in time for thousands of years not just a couple of stories, for thousands of years, it tells us how God interacted with his people. As a matter of fact, God in this book has given himself 956 different names. Yeah, and it all depended on the situation that people were in, the, the, the character of the person that they were dealing with. What would speak to that individual person? This name will. What will speak in this situation? This name will. And so he named himself the Prince of Peace, the Lion of Judah, the Alpha and the Omega. He called himself light and love and truth and the giver of all things and all that is good. And he called himself all of these things within Scripture. And then at one point, he just said, I am. I am what? I am. I am everything. Future, past, present. I am absolutely everything. I am. And we don't know that until we look through scripture and find out who the I am is. Because that's our only way to get to know who God is. Because God is a living, breathing being and he can speak to us through scripture. So, this is a really, really big part of finding peace because it helps us to find who God is. Scripture does three things for us. The first thing is it gives perspective. Um, when I take my glasses off and I look, oh my goodness, they're really dirty. <laughs> I didn't even realize how dirty they were. Um, but I can see a streak. I can see a spot. I can see all of these different things when I'm looking at my glasses. When I'm looking at my glasses, they are horrendous, and they're probably cheap enough that I'm not even going to get that stuff off. But when I put my glasses on and I look through my glasses, it changes my view of everything. It lets me read. It changes my perspective completely. And that's what we need to do when we look at Scripture. Not just read Scripture, not look at Scripture, but how does that deal with my life? How does that affect how I'm living my life daily? Read through scripture because that, that's my hope for you is that when you learn who God is, that it, you don't just learn who God is, but who is he to you? Personalize it. Who is God trying to be to you? When I read, um, I, can, I have a choice. I can view my life just going through like my daily schedule. This is what I do at nine. This is what I do at 10. This is what I do at 11. Or I can view my life through Ephesians 2.10, which says God created me to be a masterpiece and he is going to create something new daily within me to fill his perfect purpose and plan. That changes my perspective completely on how I live my day. Completely. Like, I'm not just going through a routine. I have purpose. I have a plan. I'm a masterpiece. Amen. And it changes everything when you look through a different perspective. The second thing it does is it gives clarity. 
The world tells us a lot who God is. This is the only truth of who God is. When we view our relationships with each other, we are shaped by our perception of each other. Like, um, you know, I have a friend that, you know, every time I'm going to talk, I'm like, hmm, can I, can I trust this information with this friend? Hmm, maybe, maybe yes. Um, can I, if I go to something with a problem, is this friend going to tell me what I want to hear or what I need to hear? Or then, you know, I might have another friend that it's like, is this the friend that's smart enough to get me out of that stupid escape room? I am not that friend, just so you know that, okay? But we, are, we base our, what we're willing to share, what we're willing to, the relationship we have on our perspective of who they are. We do the same thing with God. We base our relationship with God based on our perception of who God is. If we have grown up with the perception that God is the cause of all the bad that's gone on in our lives, why would I want to trust him? I don't know anything good. Or if I grew up with the experience of, of a difficult dad that didn't show a lot of love, then maybe that's the perception that I have of my heavenly father. Judgmental, ready to come down on you whenever you screw up. And that's my perception of God. Well, I don't, I don't want to trust a God like that. It shapes everything. And then the consequences is that I view God with fear, bitterness, anger, disappointment, I just don't even think he cares. But that's not the God that we read about. The world will tell us a lot of stories of who God is. Our mind will even shape who God is based on our own experiences. But this is the only truth that tells us who God is. And you cannot follow God if you don't know who he is. You cannot follow what you don't know. And you have to know him in order to be able to follow him, in order to allow him to start shaping your thoughts and your actions. And the third thing is that it tra initiates transformation. We can't transform ourselves. Like a seed can't grow to a plant all by itself. We cannot initiate transformation. God has to do that. Spiritual formation, me growing spiritually, is an act of grace. It's an act of God's grace in my life. I think one of the greatest myths of Christianity is that we can try harder. If we just try harder, then we'll get more grace and we'll get more love. All we need to do is know him better. Know him better. Know him more. And he initiates that transformation within us. What our job is, is to create the environment where he can work. Create the openness through prayer, the giving things over, knowing who he is, allowing him to speak into our life, that is what we do, and God does the real work because he's the one that starts transforming our mind, transforming our brain, putting thoughts in there through scripture that we get from time with him. I can create the environment where God can take my perspective, give clarity through who he is, Allow me to look at him in this new and incredible way by looking through scripture, not just at it, but by looking through scripture, he can transform my thinking. And then when I start practicing what he's asking me to transform, it changes every part of who I am, every single part. And it changes my life. It changes my decisions. It changes my actions. It changes my reactions to be closely followed, closely followed to him. Because this is the most important thing we need to know. When I look through the lens of the divine, when I look through the lens of who God is, what God's plans are for my life, God himself, when I look through that lens, my perspective changes about everything in my life. But really... This is a nice pipe dream. <laughs> I know that the Bible says it, but how do I really live that? Is that really even possible to do that, to change everything, to change my thinking? I've been thinking like this a long time. Is it really even possible to change my thinking? Well, Dr. Caroline Leaf, who I mentioned before, has devoted her whole life to, to doing this brain research, and this is what she says. 
She says, you have an extraordinary ability to determine, achieve, and maintain optimal levels of intelligence, mental health, peace, and happiness, as well as the prevention of disease in your body and mind. You can, through conscious effort, gain control of your thoughts and feelings, and in doing so, you can change the programming and chemistry of your brain. What? I know. Science, well, this, is, this is awesome. Science is finally catching up with the Bible, showing us proof that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's in 2 Timothy 1.7. Breakthrough neuroscientific research is confirming daily what we instinctively knew all along. What you are thinking every moment of every day becomes a physical reality in your brain and body which affects your optimal mental and physical health. These thoughts collectively form your attitude, which is your state of mind. And it's your attitude and not your DNA that determines much of the quality of your life. I was just born that way. Your attitude and not your DNA determines much of the quality of your life. And here is the research that she's done. Um, let's go to those two pictures here. Because the first picture I showed you, where there's that hole where you have a toxic thought, every, every, this is blown up really big, of course. When you start reprogramming your brain, when you start spending time with God, learning who God is, learning who God says you are, you can start reprogramming your brain and new shoots start. They regrow. How cool is that? You can change your brain and the way that it functions. And if you see, it's even stronger. Look at those, those tendrils that have, that have, I know she has a better, better word for that, but they grow and they connect and they become even stronger than they were before. It is possible to completely rewire our brain with new and healthy thought processes. And here's the thing. Science tells us that we can do it. Scripture has told us that we can rewire our brain with all that is good and lovely and praiseworthy. Think on these things. Marketing has even told us that our brain can change and our desires and our wants can change but how do we do it? Script research has shown that five to 16 minutes a day of focused meditating, capturing of thoughts, a deep thinking activity increases the chance of a happier outlook on life. When we direct our attention by capturing our thoughts, we provide a target for our mental capacities. So, scripture tells us that target should be God himself because he is the true healer of all. So when we have that anxiety, when we have that stress, we can reprogram our brain when we know who God is. When we know who God is and we can put our faith in that, in what we don't see instead of what we see, it changes our outlook on everything. So how do I begin? Philippians tells us, Start with casting all your cares on him. Start with turning your anxieties over into him with prayer. Start with prayer. Because I don't know about you, but when fear has me, fear or not even caring, I either, my mind is going 10,000 ways and I don't know which way to go, or it's like, I got nothing. Either one, start there and turn it over to God and say, you know what, I am, I, I can't even think clearly right now. My anxiety is off the charts. God, I need, I need you to just, just come and do something. I don't even know what it is, but God, I just need you to, to take it and do something with it. I need, I need that peace that you're talking about. The peace that, that peace that passes all understanding, I need that right now. Or, God, I feel pretty good. I know that's probably not right. <laughs> I need to know who you are. I need that peace that I don't even understand right now. And you bring it to him. And then you focus on a scripture passage. And here's the two things that you need to focus. The first, ask, ask yourself these two, these two questions as you're looking at your scripture passage. One, what does this say about God? What does this passage say about God? And the second is what does God think about you? 
What is this passage saying that God thinks about you? What does this say about God? What does God think about you? Write it down. Sometimes when I write it down, it makes it more real. How does this change the way you think? If you know these two things, how does this change the way you think? How does it change the way that you make decisions? How does it change the way you live your life? How does it change what you think about God? How does it change the way that you know that God now thinks about you? How does it change the way that God wants to work through you? This isn't a quick fix. It's a process. You can't go in there two days, two days. God, I'm still mad at that person driving slow in the fast lane. I probably always will be. I'm just, let's just admit it. But my reaction to it can change. God can completely rewire my thoughts, my actions, my reactions to be exactly in complete peace. Because here, this is, this is uh, the coolest thing that I found while I was in my studies. When we allow God to work through our thoughts and our decisions and our actions, in verse 7, in verse 7, it's that the print, the, here, go ahead and put that up there. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding. So in verse 7, it's the peace of God that transcends all understanding. But after we've spent time with God, after we realize who he is, how amazing he is, and what he wants to do in our life, through us, in us, created us to be, it completely changes our perspective of who God is. Because after all of that process, in verse 9, he's the God of peace. He is transformed in your life to not just being an attribute, but to being a being, to being something that we can place our hope in, to where we can place everything in, not just a peace that we can get whenever we need it, but a way of living our life. Not because our situations change, but because we have a God that doesn't. Through everything, he will be there. He is the God of peace, the author of peace. And he can hold us and sustain us no matter what we're going through. Christian Ronaldo is a famous soccer player. And they decided to do this study because they wanted to know how his brain thought while he was in the middle of a game. So they hooked him up to all these probes and, and then they sent him out on the soccer field to play a game because they wanted to know, you know, what's, what happens when he's formulating a play? What, what in his brain spikes? When he, uh, when he is looking for, for an open spot, when he scores a goal, what spikes, what area of the brain spikes? What, how does his brain function as he's thinking so much about the game? And at first, they thought that their test didn't work because nothing happened. There were no spikes. There were no dips. There was nothing. And they thought, oh, well, this didn't work. And then they realized, no, here's the thing. He is such a good soccer player. It has been a part of his life for so long that he doesn't even have to think about it anymore. That it just comes naturally to him, kicking a goal, making a play, seeing an open spot, stopping the defense, all of it. He didn't even have to think about it anymore. It was all reaction because he had lived his life in soccer for so long. Whew. When I apply this to my life in God, it gives me chills. When I know who God is so clearly that it doesn't matter what's being thrown at me, it's just my natural reaction. God's got it. Yeah, it hurts. Yeah, I don't want to go through this. Yeah, this is kind of yucky. Yeah, I'm not feeling anything right now. But I have the God of peace that I am walking with side by side because I know him. I, I've allowed him to transform my thoughts. I've allowed him to restructure my brain. I've allowed him in my life, in my thoughts, in my actions, in my reactions, and it changes everything about my life. I can get rid of addictions. And I can have freedom. I can turn my grieving, even though my pain hasn't lessened, the comfort that I have from Christ is continual. I can take my broken life to him, and he could say, oh, but see, I love you with an everlasting love. Don't you know that? And I can be full. 
And I can take all of the pieces of my fear, of my anxiety, of all of this, and I can just say, blah. And he takes it, and he gathers it all together. He said, I'm giving you peace because you know who I am. You know who I am, and you know that you can trust me. And even when all I have is that unsettled kind of feeling, he can provide complete and total satisfaction. Because knowing this God of peace, living with this God of peace, really knowing who he is can change your life. I'm going to, just a, a quick story in Probably nobody in this room knows the story. So um, open it up. My greatest time of anxiety actually wasn't being stranded on a mountain. It was um, when I was in between my sophomore and junior year of college, and I was engaged to be married, not to the husband I have now. And um, I kind of in my heart knew that maybe it wasn't a great match, but I loved him, right? I loved him. And I remember the whole year going, God, if this isn't your will, if this isn't your will, I need you to tell me. I just don't know. And I, I just, I mean, I love him, but, but I, if this isn't your will, I need you to tell me. So I'm, I'm, I, I'm upset. I'm living my life. Nobody knows I'm upset. It's all deep inside there. I said, but God, God, if, you, if, if, you, if this isn't right for me, you need to let me know. And so there, there came a point in time. It's uh, May. I'm getting married right at the beginning of July. And it's... Uh, middle of May, and I'm going to Europe for three weeks, coming back, and I have a week and a half before my wedding. And, um, and so I am leaving, and I get on a phone call with my parents. So at this point, I'm, I've transferred colleges. I have, I have rearranged my entire life in order to move to South Dakota and get married. And um, on this one phone conversation, my parents tell me that they're moving from South Dakota, and they're moving to Kansas City, never even knew, um, and that... Um, Dad said, your mom has told me about some of the, the feelings that you've been having, the unsettled feelings that you've been having, and Tammy, I think you really need to listen to those. And I think, I think you really need to spend some time in prayer to God on this. And at that point, I really knew that that's probably what I needed to do was call off the wedding, but I made a commitment. This is what I was supposed to do. So in one phone conversation, I kind of felt like I was li- losing my past because my parents were moving. I was losing my present because of this decision that I was kind of feeling I really did have to make, and I was losing my future as well because I had no plans. They were being ripped out from under me. Now, that may sound dramatic at the moment, but at that moment, it was everything, and I was hysterical. I was um, not at home. I am in some stranger's house because I'm on my way to Europe, Um, and my college roommate wound up being my roommate that night, and I just sobbed hysterically. Because I'm like, I, I don't feel anything. I can't do this. This is overwhelming. This is, this is too much. I can't, I can't make this decision. I can't do it. And my college roommate, who is my spiritual warrior in Christ, she started singing, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea pillows roll, that's all I need. Because despite my situation, I know who God was. Because he had been present in my life before. And this peace washed completely over me. And um, this is where it gets a little weird, but amazing. (laughs) God transports my mind to a place of my childhood that was always so incredibly peaceful. And he just calmed me. And my roommate didn't hear it, but I heard words so clear in my mind, you know what you have to do. I'll be with you. It changed everything. It changed everything. I didn't cry another tear because my situation didn't change one bit. I still was calling off the wedding. I still had to walk gifts back door to door, which was horrible. I still came away from those doors crying. But I had the peace of God. I had the God of peace walking with me every step of the way. And it transformed me. It transformed my life. 
It transforms my life today. And I don't know why God gave me that experience. I don't know why he spoke to me in that way, other than that I'd asked for it for a full year. (laughs) But I do know that the God of peace is available to each and every one of us. And all we need to do is provide him that opportunity to begin to transform our mind, to begin to trust in the peace that he's offered. And that's what I want to do today. I want to give you a little time to practice this idea of thinking about the things of God, of begin thinking about who God is, about making it such a part of your life that it's not reaction, but just the way you live. Couldn't that transform everything that we weren't thrown to and fro to and fro from all these different situations, but we were able to just put our trust completely in the God of peace. So I want to give ourselves just a few moments today, not five to 16 minutes, just a few moments to think. So I'm going to be putting scripture, well, not me specifically, but there will be scripture on the screens. But I just want you to think about, and I want you to ask these two questions to yourself. Again, what does this say about God? What does the scripture passage say about God? What does God think about you? What does God think about you? When you read this, what do you think God thinks about you? What does this say about God? What does God think about you? And then, how does this change the way that you think? Let me pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the hope that you can transform our minds. that we don't just have to settle for peace every so often, but that you can be the God of peace to us. No matter what we're going through, no matter what we're dealing with now or what we deal with in the future and we don't even know that's coming. But Lord, that you are real to us. You speak to us through your scripture, through prayer, When we create the environment to allow you to speak, you will do it. We have that hope that we can hope in you. Be with us in these next few minutes. Lord, be real, be present to us as we become extremely real to you in our time of thinking, Lord. That as we seek, that we find you. And we find this peace through any darkness that we are going through. Let's call these things in your name. Amen.
Your name.